Hi, let's um, let's get started. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome everybody to this uh, to this June update of global liquidity. Um, in terms of summarising uh, where we are, um, maybe this statement sort of says pretty much everything that we're that we're seeing. Um, I think the FOMC meeting yesterday was actually will probably prove a watershed. It seems that the Federal Reserve is actually now pretty intent on uh, controlling inflation. Um, there were, you know, hints obviously along the along the route that um, uh, inflation was going to be dismissed as a uh, as an irrelevant issue. With lots of, uh, you know, talk about uh, allowing it to uh, to move significantly above uh, some long term trend. I think the uh, the reading between the lines of yesterday's statement, uh, I think inflation is much, much more of an issue that they're focusing on. Uh, what you're seeing um, uh, in terms of our outlook is that central banks are basically reflecting some of the underlying trends in the private sector. And I want to bring that out later on in the presentation. Uh, effectively, bond markets are demanding attention to low inflation. I think that's fairly clear. But in terms of the direction of liquidity, central banks seem to be following what is a deteriorating uh, liquidity situation within the private sectors. And, you know, as we've said here in this statement, effectively, you've got a sort of two headed monster. Uh, either uh, you've got to feed inflation or you've got to allow uh, and you've got to allow debt refinancing. You can't really have uh, uh, low inflation and debt refinancing. There's a dilemma there. And addressing that dilemma basically means negative real interest rates probably for longer and more volatility. Coming out of that, gold may well be an interesting investment. In terms of running through the, the data, this is just really for, uh, for background. Uh, for those of you that uh, want to look at pictures of how much liquidity has increased and what's going on, uh, this is just the backdrop of where we are in, in liquidity terms. And what I've put on that pie chart is to show who the big players are. We'll dive into that in a bit more detail later. But effectively, liquidity clearly has been abundant. What we're really looking at now is some evidence of a peak and some slowing. This is much more obvious in our liquidity index, which is shown here, which is really a measure of momentum of liquidity. And as you can see, that is very clearly inflected and is going down. And it's that inflection which I think is having uh, an increasing impact, creating a headwind in markets and economies going forward. The importance of liquidity shouldn't be lost when you look at this slide here, which is basically tracking uh, the movement in global liquidity uh, going back, what, 40 years, and uh, the value of all wealth, in other words, financial wealth plus housing wealth plus precious metals in one aggregate. And that black line is basically showing an annual rate of change and the liquidity data, which is the orange line, the year on year growth in liquidity is very neatly uh, preceding that. What we're seeing now is a clear peaking uh, in the global liquidity data, which basically would suggest that asset markets are near uh, peaks in terms of year on year growth. May still say that they go up a bit more, but I think the, the warning here is that we're seeing some sort of inflection. And the question is, how quickly do we come down? The heat map that you can see here is broadly attesting to that. It may be a little bit difficult to see the granulation, but uh, you know, peak liquidity is clearly passed, and you're seeing some central banks that are seeing uh, or demonstrating more obvious tightening measures. Uh, the UK, Switzerland are obvious from the bottom of the chart. Um, you can see it probably in the Chinese data, but even if you look at the graduations in the US data, you can see that the Federal Reserve is starting to take that stimulus away. And I think that uh, is more and more obvious if you look at uh, some of their sort of uh, uh, more day-to-day uh, -day or even week-to-week -week activity. In terms of where we are in, in liquidity terms, let's try and spell out um, some of the impact of central bank balance sheet or QE activity uh, really since the COVID crisis. And you know we can think of that as being QE6 uh, along the along the route, uh, you know, going starting way back in um, uh, in 2007 eight with QE one, uh, and then obviously going through the numbers. But this is the latest iteration, which is QE six. Uh, in terms of that first column, that's showing which central banks are the most important, and you can see there that it's pretty much shared between 
the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, and the People's Bank of China. Uh, and then everybody else sort of neatly fits into the other, you know, the other fifth, if you like. So you've got uh, four big players and the rest. And if you look at the growth in their balance sheet since the COVID crisis, it's very much led by the ECB and trailed by the US in second place. But clearly, those are the most active central banks. Bank of Japan's responded a bit. People's Bank of China, tad, but not really very much. And then other central banks have sort of followed the leaders. Um, in terms of um, what is their contribution uh, to the QE6 uh, regime, uh, you can see there in column three that, you know, something, something like, you know, the bulk of it has really come through uh, from the Fed and the ECB. And then you go to the final column and you see actually what's been happening in the last three months. What's the contribution to the growth uh, in liquidity from central banks uh, in the last three months. And it's pretty much been dominated, uh, you know, well over 80% has basically come out of the Federal Reserve and the ECB. So watching them very closely is critical. And what we're arguing now is that the Federal Reserve has already started this process of not just thinking about tapering, but probably actually tapering too. This chart tries to show that. Uh, and what we've done is to illustrate um, with, with two lines. The, uh, the red line or the darker red line is not the balance sheet, it's actually base money. And, you know, you can argue in different ways, which is the most important thing to look at. But in terms of the net co liquidity contribution to the system, uh, base money pretty much spells it out. Uh, that's the, the net amount of money that the private sector is getting uh, from the monetary authorities. The orange line that you see traced alongside is basically withdrawals of liquidity uh, on the liability side of the central bank balance sheet. And that's things like reverse repos, which directly take liquidity out of the system. And uh, a buildup of what we've said there is treasury gen, which is the treasury general account. So you can think of the red line as being the effective balance sheet size and the uh, orange as being the withdrawals, the actual withdrawals by the central bank. And the point about the chart, what the chart's trying to say is that the orange line is basically used to slow the impact of balance sheet expansion on the private sector. And what you're seeing now is a step up uh, in terms of that activity. And that's broadly come through because what you've had is not just simply a rundown, as many people argue, in the Treasury General account, uh, which actually would uh, or is illustrated there by the fall in the orange line, but actually that's been more than offset now by uh, increases in reverse repos. So effectively what the central bank is doing is net withdrawing liquidity uh, from, uh, in terms of their balance sheet expansion. So the overall impact is a flatlining on, uh, on base money. And that suggests to us that, you know, basically the game is up now. Um, the Federal Reserve is beginning to take liquidity out of the system. Now, one of the reasons that may be the case, and there's a couple of charts which try to test to this, is if you look at the inflation pass through through different decades, and I was actually quite surprised by this data because it wasn't what I expected, but it may be telling us something about the inflation landscape going forward. Now, what this is, is regression loadings that have been estimated uh, looking at monthly inflation shocks and basically it's saying how much of that monthly inflation shock is transmitted to the next month. And if you have a sustained inflation environment, such as the 70s and then the 1980s, what you tend to find is, is large pass-throughs. In other words, that inflation expectations tend to be quite sticky. Uh, in other words, it's difficult to get rid of the inflation once it's there. So in other words, if you get a series of supply-side shocks, uh, you're going to see a, a sustained level of inflation coming through from that. And that's basically what I think is the outlook going forward. May not be seeing, you know, very high inflation, but we're seeing a nagging level of inflation. And what those coefficients basically are saying, and what the data highlighted in red says, is that something like 70% or so of any inflation shock gets transmitted to the next period. And that historically is quite a high percentage. So there's actually quite a high pass through going on. 
and actually more than I would have expected anecdotally without looking at the data. The second thing to say is, you know, how much are bond vigilantes sort of in control again? And what this is then saying is, what is that inflation pass through to the bond markets? Now, we may well already have had the peak rates of month on month inflation that, you know, that may be the case. But the point here is that the inflation transmission through to the bond markets tends to be quite high. And you look at it relative to history, uh, what we're seeing is the highest decade since the 80s. Uh, the reason the 80s are higher uh, than the 70s is simply that that's when the bond market sort of got control back. And maybe they've got control back again. So what this is broadly saying is that if there is an inflation problem, the bond markets will basically pick that up very quickly and yields will rise. But it may be that policymakers are already onto this now, and it may well be, uh, and I think the evidence could well prove this, that uh, inflation may well have peaked on a month to month basis, but it's gonna remain nagging. The other thing to say in this picture, which is leading on to uh, uh, an argument that will come through later, is what about the other, let's say, big central bank outside of the ECB, uh, which is uh, which is we've got to pay attention to, and that is China. And the reason that I highlight this is there's so much discussion about the PBOC tightening, and we just don't see any evidence of that in the data. I mean, you could dance on the head of a pin and say that bottom left-hand chart is doing that, but I don't really think so. I mean, at the, at all they're doing is running a pretty neutral stance. Uh, and this is the, the bottom left-hand chart is the cumulative uh, three more three month annualized growth in, uh, in all open market operations over that three rolling three month window. So that seems to have stabilized. The Chinese are neither easing nor, uh, nor, uh, uh, nor tightening. And if you look at their daily open market operations, it, there's actually virtually nothing going on. They're not even, they're not putting money much into markets at all. Uh, and they're certainly not taking anything out really. And then the chart to give you perspective is the, is the one behind that, the bigger one, the orange and black uh, chart, which is basically illustrating the overall balance sheet of the People's Bank, which is just saying that you're seeing, broadly speaking, very gentle upward growth. I mean, it's almost flatlining, uh, but I mean, the growth rates seem to be stabilizing and an annualized uh, six month growth rate of sort of circa 5% or so. Um, so, you know, the, the days of massive accommodation are probably over, uh, but you can see as well by the dominance of the black area over the orange, the orange being foreign exchange reserves, that uh, the PBOC is running a very active policy now. I mean, it's in control. It's not simply monetizing Forex reserves. Forex reserves are sort of flat as well, but it's running, uh, you know, an active policy. And this is, this is by design. So it's absolutely wrong to say that the People's Bank are trying to slow the economy uh, at all. Uh, any slowdown in the Chinese economy that we're seeing is coming for other reasons. Now, let's look at this in terms of the context of all liquidity. And again, you get the picture. This is looking at all sources of global liquidity, private sector and uh, central bank. Uh, it's saying there that you've really got, uh, if you like, three big players because Japan punches much higher. Uh, much above its weight in terms of central bank, uh, but in terms of overall liquidity for the world economy, uh, the Japanese financial system doesn't produce very much. The dominant players here are the US, Eurozone and China, uh, with China sort of, uh, you know, more equivalent to its economic size at, uh, you know, just under 30% of total liquidity. We show there the change since QE6, and I think the key point to take away there is that actually China, despite what the People's Bank has been doing, uh, the Chinese financial system has actually been uh, uh, producing quite a lot of liquidity out of this. But in the course of the last three months, uh, where most of the impetus has really come is again out of the US and the Eurozone. So those are markets that are worth, uh, you know, spending a bit more time on to try and understand the liquidity dynamic. And Japan is sort of irrelevant in terms of overall global liquidity. Now, this, I think, is the interesting perspective which is, uh, which is looking at the disaggregation of liquidity between the private sector and policymakers, in other words, the central banks, in two different eras. Um, what I've shown is uh, on the right-hand side, the past, which is the 1980 to 2000 period, and the, if well, I've called it the future, but it's actually the more recent past, but 
probably is also the future looking forward uh, over the course of the 2000 to 2020 uh, period. Now, what I was trying to bring out of this is that if you look at the right hand chart, the history, uh, the past period, 1980 to 2000, it seems to be clear there or clearer that the central banks, the blue line, were much more proactive and they were the ones that were virtually leading the private sector. Uh, in other words, whenever the central banks got the bit between their teeth and tightened or eased, the private sector responded. And so the central banks were very much in control. And that was, if you like, the era of, uh, of, uh, of Volcker and maybe Greenspan. What you have seen uh, in the period since 2000 is a very different makeup. And it seems to be fairly obvious from that, looking at the data, that it's the private sector that is moving first and the central banks are reacting. And you can see that in, the, uh, in those circles that I've highlighted in those examples, but these are just periods of, uh, of when, you know, of recent peaks in liquidity, but you can equally, equally label the troughs and look at pretty much the same story. So in other words, the central banks seem to be following what the private sector is doing and private sector liquidity is falling away. And why is that private sector falling away? Well, it's a combination, I would suggest, of the fact that uh, what's going on is that uh, there's obviously a lot of fiscal spending and a lot of monetary accommodation, but the private sector is are not really generating the cash flow that you might expect coming out of that. And that's what the fall in the orange line is saying. Uh, and it may well be that cash flow is being sapped by inventory build. It may be sapped by uh, increasing cost pressures. It may even be going into capex, but it's not really staying in the financial markets. What does that mean? Well, I think it may well be signaling the fact that uh, yield curves could well be peaking. Now, uh, you know, let's fess up here. I thought that the yield curve peak would be later this year, uh, but we may already be seeing it. And what I've drawn up here is our liquidity data uh, with the yield curve with liquidity advanced by eight months, which is the normal sort of lead time, you know, somewhere between six and nine months for the effect on bond markets. And you can see that this is lining up pretty well. Uh, and what it's suggesting is the inflection in uh, liquidity that we're already seeing that is coming from a slowing private sector and now a, a reinforcing action by central banks is basically uh, preceding and uh, the leading relationship is at, on this chart coinciding with this inflection that you're seeing in the yield curve. That may be more obvious. And this is the, by the way, the yield curve is the conventional US 10-2 spread. That may be even more obvious if you look at a real yield curve, uh, which is basically illustrated here um, in terms of the US index linked or TIPS, 10 year minus five year. And again, that's the same relationship. The liquidity data has been pushed on uh, by uh, again, eight to nine months. Uh, so it's showing a leading relationship. The interesting difference this time is the amplitude of the 510 tips curve in the US is more or less at, it, at its normal uh, amplitude. And what that's doing is showing an inflection. So it may be that all these uh, stars are lining up and what you're getting is the yield curve flattening. Now, what the yield curve flattening basically says in this case is that real term premia are coming down. And if real term premia are coming down, that would suggest to me that real interest rates are falling and likely to come under downward pressure. Uh, and that I think is uh, an important takeaway if that's true. And that pretty much coincides with the liquidity story we've got. Now, why is looking at that data important? Uh, just as a, as a sort of uh, backup, this is the regression plot and a Granger causality test to say why liquidity leads the yield curve or in particular leads the fixed income markets. So declining uh, liquidity basically means that yield, curve, yield curves flatten and bond yields more often go down uh, during those periods. So uh, this is completely in line with history, in other words. What does it mean for the real economies? Well, if you look at this chart, what we've got here is business confidence across all the major economies. And these are things like uh, the US ISM, the UK CBI survey, the TANCAN, the FAS survey in Germany, 
uh, etc. And what that's basically illustrating is that liquidity, the red line uh, advanced here by again eight to nine months, is basically illustrating uh, an inflection coming in real economies. And that's what the data seems to be showing. So again, you've got a pretty consistent picture. And it looks as if, uh, you know, despite the euphoria about economies, it looks as if uh, business confidence is rolling. Now, why is that data important? The reason it's important is it has a very long history. And what I've done here is to go right back to the 1960s to show the liquidity data in red and uh, a, a slightly narrower business confidence measure because we've just got the G4 in this uh, since that's as far back as the, that's where we can get the longest run of data. And what this basically shows is that correspondence or correlation with liquidity advanced again by about nine months uh, with regard to that world business outlook, world business confidence. So again, it's saying that we may be seeing this inflection and particularly if liquidity comes down even more than this. Now, what is the data basically illustrating uh, on a more granular uh, daily basis? Now, for the last few months, we've been uh, looking at this data, which we basically uh, put a program or build a program to, to understand, which comes from data feeds from Bloomberg and Thompson data stream. And what, it, what the data basically looks at is uh, analyst consensus forecasts on major headline economic data series compared with the outturns. And that gives us a series of economic surprises. And what you're seeing here is the a principal component of those surprises across the world fitted. And this is a normalized data series, which basically gives an therefore an illustration of economic surprises, but by corollary, what we've labeled here economic momentum. Now it looks as if economic momentum is peaking out uh, on this, uh, you know, maybe a moot point, but it looks as if it's reaching some sort of ceiling and maybe is rolling. But if you look at this companion data, which is extracting the US and the Chinese signals from that aggregate, you'll see the picture is probably more apparent. It looks as if we're seeing this downward inflection going on. But the point that I wanted to highlight in particular is the step down that we've seen since the beginning of June or la the last two or three days of May, early June uh, in the Chinese data. And given the fact that this data is normalized, that's quite an important step down uh, that we're looking at. Now, uh, what does that mean? What it means is that it may be that the Chinese bond markets are likely to be leading uh, the US market downwards, yields down. And this may be a different explanation of what's going on uh, in terms of US treasuries. Now, what I've shown here is the Chinese 10-year bond uh, shown in red and the US 10-year bond shown in yellow. And what I've tried to highlight, uh, you know, maybe successfully or not, depending on how you view it, is that it looks, particularly in the period since 2015, that the Chinese bond market is leading the US, not vice versa. Uh, and that's what it seems to be pointing to. And maybe this move in Chinese yields is important. Now, does that line up that yield move line up with the Chinese economy? Well, this chart here is basically looking at the previous series on Chinese economic momentum. So we've taken that same data that you were looking at earlier daily, run it back to 2011, uh, just extracted the monthly uh, plot from that, which is the red line, and then basically grafted against the Chinese bond yield. This is the five-year bond. Uh, which lines up rather better. But you get the point here that it may well be that Chinese interest rates are slated to drop if you look at that right-hand axis by at least 50 basis points, maybe 100 basis points. Now, if the Chinese People's Bank are not tightening, as we argue, what could be the reason that the Chinese economy is seeing this growth hiccup? It could easily be that there are supply constraints hitting the economy. It may be that there's a shortage of chips. It may be the fact that commodity prices have picked up. It may be that the Chinese authorities are directing uh, Chinese state-owned industries not to buy commodities uh, to keep their prices down. 
but then isn't that likely by definition to be causing uh, a slowdown in economic growth? So this may be, uh, you know, uh, led by directive, but it's not led by uh, any, ch any tightening of monetary policy. And it may well be a temporary move, we admit. But on the other hand, it's going to have disruptive effects on economies and it may cause the bond markets to, uh, to yields to roll over uh, in a meaningful way and translate that through into the US market. And that may well be what's happening in terms of, uh, of the yield curve, uh, the message that we're looking at. Now, what does that mean for bond markets? Well, if you look at this, uh, this spider or radius diagram, it's basically looking at which are the better bond markets worldwide. And the yellow circle, the wider you go out, the more risky the bond market. What we've seen in uh, the last uh, two or three months is that uh, that yellow line, that circle has converged more on the dotted red line, which is sort of neutral risk for bonds. But what it's really saying is that some bond markets are now looking more attractive, like UK gilts or the Canadian or the Chinese markets. Uh, and, you know, that circle is no longer expanding outwards, which I think is an important point to make. So, you know, I'm not going to say that I favour bond markets on a medium term view, because I think where yields are, they still remain pretty unattractive. But in terms of a, of a cushion against any equity fallout, they're probably not too bad at all. Now, that leads us on to say, where are we in terms of investment regimes? And what we like to do is to try and put this, uh, this taxonomy up, which is basically saying what's driving everything is liquidity. And you've got two liquidity dimensions here shown by the dotted red line, which is private sector liquidity, and shown by the yellow dotted line, which is central bank liquidity. And basically, if you're in the, uh, if you like, if you're in between the two at the top, in that middle dimension, which it says flattening yield curve, that's when liquidity is seeing its greatest momentum. And equally, when you're opposite going straight southwards, uh, that's when liquidity is seeing its, its greatest tightening. I would say that we're in that top left-hand quadrant now, where you've got weakening uh, private sector flows and central banks are sort of flip-flopping somewhere in between uh, the looser and tightening stance. And that would suggest that certainly if you look at it from a US standpoint, or maybe if you look at it even from a global standpoint, we're seeing falling exchange rates, i.e. paper money against gold, or a falling US dollar, and we're seeing signs of a flattening yield curve. Uh, and that's where we broadly think we are. Now, if you start to get more central bank tightness, in other words, uh, the recent trends continue, you're going to move around this diagram in a clockwise fashion, and you're soon going to get more evidence of a flattening yield curve, and maybe you'll start to see if central banks tighten more, uh, more evidence of, uh, of exchange rate stability. I don't think we're there on that yet, but uh, broadly, that's what we would expect to see, flattening yield curves, weaker exchange rates, and coming out of this gold may well be uh, still a, uh, an interesting investment to hold. Now, let me focus on the US for a moment, because I think the dollar is, is pretty criti critical in this equation. And what I've highlighted here, again, is the story, which is saying that private sector liquidity, uh, in the, this case in the US, is leading what the Federal Reserve is doing. And this chart is basically highlighting uh, the already strong move down in private sector liquidity. Uh, and as I say, this is measuring uh, a combination of household savings, bank credit, uh, and uh, corporate cash flow. What seems to be being hit of those three is some combination of, uh, of tougher corporate cash flow uh, and slower bank lending. But within the, you know, what's causing the cash flow to slow well, let's be, you know, let's be upfront. It could be the fact, uh, in truth, that CapEx is going up a lot and corporations are spending their cash piles. That's entirely possible. It could be they're paying for more inventory, uh, but it could equally be the costs are rising. And so it, that's affecting their cash flows. Uh, you know, certainly some combination of the three, but I would say that maybe that third is the one that, you know, is the, is the more worrying. But certainly you're seeing cash flow going down. It could easily be a case in the context of the US that more of that cash flow is being spent internationally. In other words, that uh, there's a lot of cash in the US private sector still, but it's being spent internationally 
So uh, it's dissipating globally. And that's what the twin deficits problem likely attests to. And, you know, many people are alert to the twin deficit problem, the large federal deficit and the large current account deficit, and argue that that's normally a sign of weakness in the currency. Well, it is. Uh, and this is what this chart purports to show. But basically what we're trying to argue here is that it's the gap that is critical between uh, falling private sector liquidity and lagging central bank liquidity is when there is a positive gap. Uh, in other words, where central bank liquidity outweighs private sector liquidity as now, there is downward pressure on the US dollar. And that is what this chart shows which is looking at, again, the regression analysis and Granger causality between that index, which is private sector uh, minus central bank liquidity. Uh, and what it's showing is the decline in the orange line on the left chart against the DXY index uh, deviation from its trend, which is shown as that black line. So what that's saying is looking at liquidity, relative liquidity trends, it is entirely consistent with a move of the US dollar 10 to 15% below its trend. Uh, the regression data is, is I, I think, on this compelling. Uh, if, as a heads up, you did a similar analysis looking at relative yields, uh, in other words, 10-year yields between the US and the rest of the world, your R squared on that regression would be about 0 0.05, nothing like the fit that we get looking at this data. One of the things that is instrumental in understanding the dollar is what's happening to the capital flow picture. And it's the starting point that is really crucial here. And I know I've displayed this chart before, but it's well worth reiterating the points, uh, you know, not least because, uh, you know, there is, uh, there's a lot of capital that could come out of the US on bad news. Uh, and what this is basically illustrating is capital flows as a percentage of global liquidity with uh, three regions highlighted. The black line is the Americas, uh, yellow is Asia, red is Europe. Now the reason for that slightly wonky definition of Americas is that what we've done here is we forced effectively the US to be the residual. And the reason for that is that if you look at US data, US data is distorted or biased by the fact that a lot of hedge funds and other entities operate out of tax havens like the Cayman Islands, and therefore a lot of uh, US dollar transactions are booked there, but that's outside of US uh, traditional data. So what we've done is done it in a reverse, and we've looked at what flows are going into or leaving Europe and going into or leaving Asia, and saying the residual is the dollar zone. Uh, and I think that gives a much, much more accurate flavor of what's really going on. Now, what we've tried to show here is that there are three big periods of uh, demand for, uh, for dollar assets. The mid-1980s, when Japanese insurance companies were freed up to buy U.S. treasuries, the Asian crisis, where there was great demand for U.S. safe haven assets, and the period since the GFC 2008-9, where you basically saw uh, a significant increase in safe asset demands because of Basel III, you got the China anti-corruption drive around the middle of the decade. And just prior to that, you have the Eurozone banking crisis. So the US was definitely flavor of the decade and people winged into US safe assets. Uh, the COVID crisis has seen a similar jump in demand for US assets, although I'd hesitate to add that most of that demand has not been for US treasuries. It's been for US tech stocks and corporate debt, uh, which may say the dollar is a bit more cyclical than normal. But effectively, you're starting from a very high position uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, dollar demand or dollar capital flow. And that picture, I think, is now deteriorating. Here you see the evidence of the US trade weighted dollar in terms of its long term downtrend illustrated by those dotted nine channels and the periods where the dollar is significantly above uh, its mid trend line. Uh, which we've highlighted, which seem to be periods of excess demand for safe assets, which line up very well with this earlier chart of the three uh, peaks there. And what you can say is that these are periods where the US has uh, engineered excess demand for dollars uh, alongside a, let's say, a medium term period 
where there's a general excess supply of dollars. And that trend seems to be dominant. Uh, and if the Fed is, you know, printing, still printing money, uh, you're going to see that, uh, you know, uh, uh, as, a, as an obvious trend. So in other words, what this is basically saying is you could be seeing mean reversion here, which basically would explain uh, the 15 percent or so drop in the in the value of the dollar that we're suggesting. But it could equally be an overshoot. Because if you if you go to that bottom trend line, you're looking at something nearer a 30% drop uh, in the value of the dollar. So this is uh, something to watch out for. And you know I'm not in the camp that says that the dollar uh, continues to go up because I think the mechanisms are different this time. In terms of forex risk, uh, you know where are the currencies that really stand out? Uh, again, what this is diagram is showing is looking at these same forex risk measures. So it's basically looking at uh, uh, you know, the gap between private sector and central bank liquidity. Uh, the dotted red line is basically the uh, neutral position. Uh, and you can see from this that generally most paper currencies are beyond that red dotted line saying gold is attractive. That's telling us gold is attractive. The Australian dollar looks to be uh, very different from that. But you can see that the euro countries and the eurozone itself uh, you know, look pretty good relative to other paper units. Uh, sterling's not too bad. So the European units come out of this pretty well, uh, whereas the dollar looks, you know, higher risk and emerging market currencies generally look higher risk. Uh, but Aussie dollar stands out. Canadian dollar doesn't, as you can see. Uh, and, uh, and neither does the yen rather mysteriously. But the yen hasn't been a strong currency for a long time now. Let me say something about equities and sort of round up. One of the things that you're seeing in the data is risk positioning is beginning to peak as well uh, from the data. The yellow line is looking at global liquidity and the red line is our measure of risk exposure, which is basically looking at how investors are investing their portfolios between uh, equities, fixed income, liquid assets. In other words, broadly, uh, a risk asset, less safe asset division. Uh, the higher you go on that chart, it's a normalized chart ranging between typically minus 50 and plus 50. The higher you go, the more risk exposure there is. And the lower you go, the more, uh, the more caution uh, uh, risk aversion there is in the, in the actual portfolio allocations. I stress this is all done on flow data or stock data. It's actual positioning data that we're looking at here. Uh, and we can get this, as many of you probably know, on a very granular or timely basis uh, now through the wonders of, um, uh, of the web. Uh, what this basically seems to suggest is that rather like the peak in liquidity, uh, both now and historically, uh, that is preceding uh, a peak in risk exposure. Uh, and that would, you know, that would suggest that investors are going to start paring back uh, some of their extreme exposure. What is that extreme exposure? Well, if you look at probably the, 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 the most, well, I say the most worrisome, but of the bigger markets, the most worrisome chart, which is looking at how US risk exposure uh, to equities relative to liquidity has moved over time. Now, for a long time, this chart was basically flatlining or around the uh, you know, area of around one to 1.1, if you like, on that ratio on the left. The peak uh, that you see there in 2000 was at about 1.3 times, uh, which was the Y2K bubble. Uh, the peak that we got to in 2008 was around 0 0.9. Uh, you know, things have become more elevated since then. Uh, but generally, the markets were range bound through 2018, 2019, until the COVID crisis pushed it right down to the 0 0.8 area. So below the GFC uh, average or the pre-GFC average. Uh, and now what you've seen is a very recent bounce up. Uh, the projection to the end of 2021 is using what liquidity we expect to go into the US market. So it'll bring it down to that range, but you're still looking at fairly high levels. So that would you know, urge some caution as well. Uh, and if you look at you know, companion charts, other markets, with probably the exception being the UK, uh, you find that you get, you know, you're looking at fairly stretched uh, equity to liquidity ratios right now. So if you again look at the equivalent 
uh, equity uh, spider diagram, if you like, in terms of risk exposure, what, what's high and what's low? Well, the, the chart spells it out. Uh, you seem to have relatively high exposure to some of those markets that have done particularly well of late. Asian emerging markets, i.e. Korea, Taiwan, uh, Eurozone markets, recently they've been very, very strong. France looks to be very high on this. Um, you know, high Korea are highlighted. The US is, is still relatively elevated uh, on that scale. Uh, UK looks low. Um, you know, Canada may be lowish, but most equity markets are sort of well above their, uh, their averages, which is shown by that uh, dotted red line. Uh, you know, the UK fell out of favour during the Brexit uh, period and fell out of favour when the initial uh, maybe sort of uh, ham-fisted response to the COVID crisis uh, occurred. Uh, and, you know, risk exposure of UK funds uh, to equities looks to be uh, certainly below their normal averages. Uh, but that may well be, you know, we may be seeing that in terms of the pickup now in small cap performance in the UK. Uh, so that's broadly where we are on that. So in terms of ranking of markets, uh, how does that diagram look? This is, again, a risk appetite, uh, a risk exposure uh, chart looking at where portfolios are skewed um, for all markets that we cover. Uh, the number of markets that you can invest in now is very small. That's sort of the lower end of that graph. The red bands are the, are the aggregates. So things like uh, all emerging markets or the world or developed markets or emer Asian emerging markets, just to highlight where those are. So you can see there immediately that Asian emerging markets are pretty high on that ranking. Uh, Eurozone's also pretty high up there, uh, etc. Uh, world market, not so bad. But the stuff at the bottom is what looks more attractive. So of the bigger markets, what does that really mean? It means things like UK, New Zealand, uh, South Africa, Singapore's down there, um, Thailand and emerging markets, Australia's down there, Japan's down there, Germany doesn't look too bad, China is at the lower end. So those markets are probably more defensive in any sell-off. Uh, and you want to be gearing there or leaning there rather than the other stuff. Uh, to finish. This is the dilemma I think the central banks basically face. And this is the long-term picture between debt and between liquidity. And the point that we make uh, increasingly is that financial markets are no longer new capital raising mechanisms, they're refinancing mechanisms. Something like four or five dollars uh, that are transacted in financial markets are all about debt refinancing uh, to every $1 that is used for new financing. So in other words, the CapEx, uh, CapEx has dropped away uh, in importance. Uh, capital markets don't raise money for CapEx or uh, new ventures that much anymore. Uh, it's all about debt refinancing or rolling over debt. And the whole point about rolling over debt is you need balance sheet and you need liquidity to do that. And every time consequently, particularly in the last decade or so, that we've seen central banks or liquidity generally dipping, uh, you get a taper tantrum, so-called, or a sell-off in markets, because those tensions, the refinancing tensions, tend to uh, become to the fore. And I can't see why we're going to get out of it this time. So it suggests that what you've got is this, what we call debt liquidity spiral, which spells out more volatility. And you basically find that uh, what this is really saying is, that you get liquidity uh, slowing, uh, term premium yield curves start to flatten, debt markets begin to begin to wobble, and then you get a liquidity effect, negative liquidity effect being compounded. Because if debt falls in value, your collateral disappears, it's much more difficult to borrow, and consequently you get less liquidity, yield curve flattens more, et cetera. So that's really the danger. So if I summarize everything in this, um, in this chart, bullets, I won't go through all of them, but you know, basically what it really says in terms of spelling this out is you've got slowing liquidity, you've got a deteriorating quality mix of liquidity. That suggests that you may be getting some volatility, maybe coming out of that gold doesn't look too bad. Uh, the Federal Reserve is, I think, de facto tapering already uh, since uh, US base money is already flatlining. The, 
FOMC statement I think we got, uh, you know, last night to my mind, uh, you know, plays up those inflation concerns. Uh, the e ECB is sort of Janus-like in the sense you've got on the one hand, on the other hand, but the thing that I'd really watch is uh, statements from some of the German inflation hawks, because I think that might ultimately prove uh, the thing that slows the ECB down. Uh, and then you've got this hit from China, which is also affecting the bond markets. So the bottom line, I think, is that yield curves may well have already begun to flatten and seeing their peak steepness, uh, that you've got the dollar under downward pressure. I think central banks and the private sector are pulling liquidity out of the system. That suggests you've got uh, a future air pocket in markets coming up uh, and maybe uh, you know, a slowing economy or uh, let's say a slowdown in the economy uh, you know, sometime around the beginning of um, 2022. Let me, uh, let me stop and see if you've got uh, any questions. Um, I can open up the chat if there is one uh, to see if anyone wants to put anything in. But um, you know, otherwise, uh, open to any questions anyone's got. We've got about 10, 15 minutes for questions. Yeah, thank you. It's Astrid. Um, I have several questions, actually. So uh, the first is on um, China, PBOC liquidity. So I know you've been pointing out that they are not the source of um, tighter liquidity, but at the same time, we know that social financing is, is weak or has been weak, um, I don't know, for the past six months. So, so how do you combine these two? That's the first question. Second question, this um, Chinese yield story and how it feeds into US treasuries. Um, I, I've heard this from other people as well. And I'd like to know what's actually the mechanism, whether it's yield hunting global growth and if it is global growth do we need to look at other sources because we do have some um, fiscal support fr from the developed world at the moment um third question i hope you're taking yeah. notes yeah, 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 yeah. third is uh, i remember that um, last time that i listened in in terms of liquidity and equity positioning you actually pointed out that equity markets weren't that overvalued compared to outstanding liquidity. Um, maybe you have an update on that one. Yeah. And the last question. So as you said, maybe this all points to a bit weaker growth um, beginning of 2022. But what I mean, my question is then what's actually the end game, right? I mean, yes, we know it's been extraordinary on the downside, on the upside we will normalize now, right? I mean, these numbers will roll over. We all know this on the economic side, on the inflation side. Um, but are we then in a situation that actually the, the, that's the end of the cycle, so to say? Or do you see something where you can make a point that then actually we will kind of recover again and be at a nice cruising speed? Okay. So, I think, yeah, okay. My well, four let, questions. Okay, let, let, <laughs> Thank you. Let, let me see what I can do. Uh, in terms of, uh, of, the, of the business cycle, if you can, you can see hopefully the slide here, which is basically looking at uh, China versus the US in terms of an economic surprise uh, data series. Now, it, it may well be that the that Chinese data is, you know, is, is not so good or whatever. Uh, and I take all those, those criticisms, uh, you know, at, at face value. But the fact is that these surprise indi indicators seem to be invariant to that, and they seem to be—they seem to move—they seem to tell us something about the economy. And the scale of this drop that we've seen at the beginning of June uh, or late May, beginning of June, is quite material, and uh, it seems to be persisting. And what it's saying is that the Chinese economy is definitively losing momentum. Now, as I said, that may be to do with the fact that it may be supply side factors. It may be to do with these directives that are telling uh, corporations not to buy raw materials or whatever. And that's that's obviously slowing them down. But I don't think it's because the uh, the monetary authorities are, are deliberately slowing down uh, money. Now, I mean, the, the point you make about um, about uh, total social financing is you know is an interesting one. I think the I think the, the, there's a whole lot of problems with total social social financing data. Uh, 
And, you know, if, if it is slowing and if it, if it does have this predictive quality, I'll come quietly, but I've never really found it to be the case. And the, the, the issue with total social financing is that what you've got uh, are three very distinct bits of it, okay? And people seem to choose whichever bit suits their story uh, at the time, which is kind of understandable. You've got the conventional banks, the high street banks in China, the, the state-owned banks. And if you look at lending by the state-owned banks, that has flatlined at a rate of 12 to 13% every year and every month uh, for much of the last decade. I mean, it's almost, it's almost a straight line. And this is a directed number. They basically expand their balance sheets by this set amount. On top of that, you've got the shadow banks, which no question, they've been slammed. Uh, but it looks as if their balance sheets are stabilizing now. They're not, they may not be growing, but they're no longer contracting. And then you've got the third bit, which is local authority bonds, which traditionally were outside of social financing, but the Chinese have just redefined that uh, category to include local authority bonds, financing bonds. And those have been very strong uh, over the last uh, 18 months, uh, indicating that there's, there's a lot of local level infrastructure spending going on. So the bottom line is that if you look at total social financing, it may be dipping a bit year on year, but I don't think it's dropping that much. One of the things that distorts the data a lot from what we see is there is tremendous seasonality in Chinese monetary data, uh, you know, partly because of Lunar New Year holiday and partly because there's still a big agricultural element in the Chinese economy. So whichever way we look at it, we, we, we can't find, let's say, compelling evidence uh, that there's tightening or the slowing down of liquidity in China. Now, as I said, if other people can do that and prove it, I'll come quietly, but I, I've not found that. The second point, which I'm not necessarily, hopefully I can get them in order, is about the business cycle. Uh, you know, is this the end game for the business cycle already? I think the thing is, is that, look, I think there are, there are, there are two things really to say about the business cycle, or maybe two and a half things to say. One is that one, the experience we've had generally in the last decade, or at least the last decade, is that high levels of debt and strong economic growth don't go together. Uh, in other words, that debt hampers the underlying rate of growth. And I think we're, you know, we're, that's something we've got to face. Secondly, uh, CapEx spending has been slow, particularly traditional CapEx spending. And I just think that is a consequence of just the vast capacity buildup that we've seen in the last two decades, particularly coming out of China and Asia, uh, you know, following, you know, reform, Deng reforms or fall of the Berlin Wall or whatever. This is not that much CapEx which really needs to be done. So I think you've got those two factors. And then the third element, the other half bit, could well be the fact that we've got, you know, demographic problems and Japan, uh, you know, highlighted what could happen there. So maybe we all are going towards a sort of uh, Japanification of our economies of just basically slow growth uh, forever. And I think that what that really says is that these monetary stimuluses give us a bump, but as soon as they start to come down, um, you know, growth sort of fades again. And that was very much the experience in Japan. So, you know, I think that there is a lot of fiscal spending and you may get a bump, but maybe the market's already got that. You know, I already discounted that. that. That could be my fear. On the question of equity valuations, um, let me let me go back to uh, to maybe this this later chart. What I've done there is rather unfairly just picked out the U.S. because the U.S. is is an extreme. And what you've had in the course of the last um, two or three months is actually quite a skew going on in terms of U.S. positioning now part risk positioning. Now, part of that is the fact that you've had two things going on or among the things are two, two major factors. One is there's been a lot of supply, new supply of corporate debt, which we treat as a risk asset. And secondly, there's been a, a, a reduction in the outstanding amount of government of uh, government debt. Actually, bizarrely, in the data, uh, Treasury's outstanding have actually fallen, uh, not risen over this period. Uh, and that's a bit of a head scratching one, but it's definitely been the case. That's what the data shows. And so if you look at, the, uh, look at this by definition, what it illustrates is that equities have moved up uh, in value. Corporate debts have been issued. Uh, government debt has come down. 
and liquidity has has, has gone sideways. So the net of the net is that actually that ratio has gone up. So you're right to say that if I was probably fairer and looked at the world overall, you'd see a lesser increase. But the US is the one maybe we've got to worry about, and this looks extended. And I think that, you know, generally speaking, the world doesn't look, uh, you know, radically out of line with normal, but it's certainly not, it's not, uh, it's not low anymore, uh, is maybe the, the way to put it. And the question is, can it face up to a decline in liquidity? And that's, that's really the question. Now, I don't know whether, did I do all of those questions? Um, tell me if I didn't, but uh, I think. Uh, I, yeah, I think you, <laughs> I think, you did I think your I best. Did. I think yes. I did. I think I did most just, of those. Just one thing. So, so when you refer to the business cycle, because we, we had talked about China and then, but then you, you, you're feeling that we would go towards um, a Japanification. That, that was your developed market approach for all of them. This wasn't just with reference to China. Yes, I think that's I think that's that's ev that's everything. Now, uh, yeah, I think that I think that what I meant was in general. Um, in fact, I just noticed there's another. Uh, let me let me um, um, slide share again because I noticed there's another question about the TGA. Someone's put up. Actually, yeah, on, on that one, I, I would have another comment. I mean, these. Um, uh, the reverse repos, of course, they, they could um, disappear as well, right, at some point. So in terms of that, the drain liquidity, that may well come back um, once the TGA doesn't uh, pump more liquidity into the market. Yes, I think that, that that's that's true. I mean, uh, look, the, the, if you come back to this debate, let, let me let me try and address these questions. What you what you've got is. I mean, this is a lot of this is, uh, you know, is nuancing and how people interpret stuff. But generally speaking, um, you know, what what we should say overall is that the gross balance sheet position is probably more important uh, in many cases than the net position. But on the other hand, what we're looking at here in terms of the liquidity impulse to the economy is the net is the net uh, factor, which is the red line. So that's the net increase in liquidity. Um, for uh, for the U.S. economy, and what happens is if the balance sheet expands, in other words, if assets expand, um, the base money uh, will only increase uh, in the circumstances where reverses, reverse repos, and the Treasury general account don't change. If they start to increase, in other words, if the Federal Reserve increases uh, its extraction of liquidity from the markets. Uh, on the other side of the balance sheet through issuing reverse repos, uh, in other words, borrowing from the market, and uh, the Treasury builds up its Treasury general account again, what you'll see is a withdrawal of liquidity. So although the balance sheet may go up, uh, the base money element, in other words, the net liquidity injection does not go up. And that's what we've been seeing. Now, um, is are these moves technical? Um, well, uh, I think you could actually make a very strong case that they're technical, and many people do. Uh, I think equally, you can look at the operational uh, changes that the Fed made last night uh, to, uh, you know, to um, interest on on money on on reserves and on the reverse repo rate. And you could say again, these are purely operational. On the other hand, it could well be that they're sort of clearing the decks here to say, well, okay, let's make these channels more efficient. So if we want to use them, we can in future. And I think that that may be, I, I don't know, you can cynically read something into that. All I would say is that what you know what you see is what you get. And the very fact that the that reserve money is no longer increasing um, is something that we ought to be alert to. And what you can see in that chart is that uh, the the sort of orangey brown line, the lighter colored line, which was going down sharply through January and uh, through the period to January and March, uh, was the main reason that that red line went up. Okay, so in other words, what the Federal Reserve was doing was uh, was having a low level of reverses relative to the big rundown in the Treasury General Account. Now, the Treasury General Account for for those of you that, that don't know about it, is basically uh, an operational account that the Treasury, US Treasury, holds at the Federal Reserve. Uh, in other words, it's just their, their bank balance, effectively, and it's used to cushion 
uh, tax uh, inflows relative to spending, uh, federal spending. Now, it's never been used as a policy tool before, I think because it's this too blunt an instrument. You can't really use it in that way. Although it was built up very aggressively uh, under the Trump, Trump Treasury for whatever reason. Uh, I mean, maybe to have a splurge of spending at the end of the year, sort of if Congress became difficult with, uh, uh, with a debt ceiling, I don't know, but there may have been some technical reasons they did that. But it was built up substantially, which is that big rise in the brown line or brown orange line. And then Biden said he wanted to run it off. And so it's come down again. And that's caused a, uh, a surge, a temporary surge in the monetary base on liquidity injections. But then what they've uh, what they've been doing recently is uh, a building up the Treasury General account a bit again uh, in the last few weeks. And they've also started to or they've been doing in parallel very aggressive re reverse repo operations to extract that liquidity from markets. So the net of the net is that withdrawal data, the brown line, orange brown line is going up again, and that's causing uh, the base money to, to flatline. So I hope that that explains uh, that, that part of the, uh, uh, of the question uh, that, was, uh, that was put. Um, I hope so anyway. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I, I won't say anything anymore. <laughs> now the other scan. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. In terms of equity allocation, you're going to recommend a shift back to defensive annual growth style. I think the corollary must be yes. Uh, I think that, that that would suggest that, you know, it, there, there may well be a rotation back again. Uh, and, it, you know, that would be the, the, the implication of saying that yields, you know, probably come down and probably, uh, probably have peaked. They're coming down a bit. I think the, you know, the concern that we would have, I mean, sort of tracing this out further, is to say that if you've got declining liquidity, that is the thing that drives everything. And in a declining liquidity environment, the reason you get taper tantrums is because debt refinancing becomes much more problematic. Uh, it's more difficult to get balance sheet capacity to roll debt over. And there's a phenomenal amount of debt that needs to be rolled over every year or every month. And if you have diminished balance sheet capacity, you will get problems, shortage of liquidity, and the markets will have a taper tantrum. And therefore, you do want some defensiveness. I mean, what I would be looking at is to try and do something along the lines of either raising a bit of cash through this period, or more particularly having some sort of uh, uh, long exposure to bond volatility, uh, such as some exposure to the move index or that, which will give uh, an equity portfolio a lot more ballast during this period. Uh, but it may well be that you're also, you know, being into, uh, you're moving back towards uh, growth is not such a bad temporary, uh, temporary move. Are there any uh, any other questions, uh, either on the chat or uh, unmuted? I don't know if there are. Yeah, if if there are not, we've we've uh, we've come towards the end. So, uh, in which case, there's uh, Michael. I've, I've got a question. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Yeah, so th thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, in in your comments at the beginning on inflation pass through. Um, presumably, and your comments on the bond market. So presumably now with, um, uh, I mean, are index linked bonds um, interesting again or? Well, I think, I think the, the implication of that could well be yes. Uh, I, I think they, they may well be because they, they're, they're very long duration. And if you're getting, um, so this is these ones. Yeah, if, you, if you're getting um, you know, the, these risks becoming paramount, in other words, liquidity being drained, uh, negative real interest rates, uh, inflation risks, um, you know, therefore, yes. I mean, you know, maybe what I didn't spell out, which I should do, because th this is sort of part of the, of the idea, is that, you know, I, I don't think we're going to go back to 1970s type inflation because I don't think the mechanisms are there for that. But I think that, uh, but I think we are going back to sort of stubborn or nagging levels of inflation. Now, I think one of the things that I, I, the reason I say that uh, it's not the former is there's um, um, number one in the 1970s, you had uh, some dominant pricing power through both OPEC and through uh, trade unions, which basically meant that 
uh, you know, as everyone knows, you've got this sort of sustained inflation uh, period. Very interesting if anyone saw it, but if anyone reads Adam Tooze's blog uh, on Twitter, where he has these sort of chart books, but he did a study a week or so ago about the German hyperinflation. And one of the things that I hadn't realized, but, you know, is, is definitely a, a sort of brilliant takeaway, is that there was great emphasis put at the time in the early 1920s on measuring inflation uh, very accurately on a very short-term basis. And the authorities put tremendous efforts into doing this, the first at the federal level, then at the, at the local level. And what that meant was you got effective indexation of, of inflation very, very quickly. There was a very big pass-through. Uh, and what I'm, what I'm alluding to now is that we may not be getting the same shocks as, or degree of shocks as you got in the 70s or the, or the 1920s, uh, but you basically have got probably quite a high pass-through. So what that would suggest is that given the fact you're gonna probably get a series of little supply shocks coming through because of shortages or bottlenecks or whatever it may be, uh, I think that we're gonna be seeing, you know, a sustained level of inflation. By that, I mean, sort of nagging on at sort of three to 4%, over may to be an 18 month period. Uh, and against that backdrop, what you will likely see is, um, you know, negative real interest rates for a longer period than maybe people have been suggesting. Um, and uh, so the answer is that probably coming out of that, uh, tips don't look too bad at all. Thank you, but watch your currency. Oh, uh, well, I, I mean, therefore I would say that if the dollar I mean, I don't think the dollar is going to stand up to this well, because I think that, I mean, my, my view would be, but maybe there's a, you know, there's obviously a bias in that. You know, I think that once you start to get inflation uh, becoming an issue or a nagging issue for policymakers, I think the Fed will be less aggressive relatively than the ECB will. And I think that, you know, already you're, you're hearing, uh, you know, in the German media, uh, and they admittedly it may, there may be mavericks doing it, but... Uh, although I'm less sure about that. I mean, there's a former finance minister was, was Schlesinger was sort of, uh, was very vocal about saying, look, enough is enough here uh, about the ECB and about federal and about uh, fiscal spending. We've got to be serious and we've got to start to tighten up. I think those voices are going to become louder if inflation become, starts to print at, at bigger levels. And, you know, it would mainly take sort of three or 4% inflation to do that. So I think that in those circumstances, the dollar weakens. And I think you are building up to a sort of twin deficit-like problem in the US uh, against the backdrop where, you know, we've seen a, a flattering level or a perfect storm of capital inflows in the last decade. Uh, and that would suggest to me there's not much more that can go into the dollar. So I would, I would do that more probably uh, in terms of European, uh, you know, European index linked or, um, uh, or hedge your dollar. Thank you. Good. Okay. Um, I think that that could well be that could well be it. So once again, thank everybody, uh, and um, look forward to meeting up next uh, next time next month. Thanks again. Have a great month. Stay well. Bye.